So hi and welcome to my channel. Today we are talking from white people to white people. <laughs> so um, <laughs> let's all introduce ourselves. Maybe, I don't know, Christina, if you would like to start. Okay, um, I'm Christina. I'm from Canada. Um, I'm not an interesting person. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> That's it. I'm so nervous. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe watch, um, <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe we should, maybe let Patrick continue first since he's very used to making videos. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Patrick. Uh, I'm 21 years old. I live in Germany and I'm a student at a music conservatory. And yeah, that's all for now. Okay. Josh, what about you? Um, so, hi, um, I'm Josh. Um, I, I'm from South Africa. I'm 19, turning 20 this year, and I'm a student. <laughs> okay. Rina, what, what about you? My name is Rina. I am 37 years old. I'm from Germany, Bavaria, and I am a self employee. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now, Matthew. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Matthew, I'm 17 years old and I am a senior in high school. And I'm from the United the States. The youngest <laughs> among <Yeah>. us. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start, like, maybe like, what's, what's really happened? I mean, like you are so young, but you're still yes. very aware of your privileges of our situation as well people in the society come I mean because yeah. that's quite unusual for the average white person right so um I didn't really grow up around a lot of white people um I guess like ever since I was a really little kid I was never really around white people um my mom made it uh important in my life to expose me to other things outside of like I guess like what normal white kids would be exposed to so yeah, I guess that's where my understanding um, comes from. So does that, like you, you being aware of certain situations, does that give you kind of like um, problems with your white family members or are they maybe even, are they aware too? Do they know or like, how is your environment? Um, my family is pretty aware, um, especially my immediate family, um, my distant family. I'm not as sure. I don't really talk to them as much. But as far as I know, the majority of my family is uh, fairly aware. They're pretty aware. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Christina, would you like to continue? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so you got I... This. <laughs> Gosh, I, the anxiety is just coursing through my body. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up, I, I would say predominantly around like a very, a, a white centered uh, life. Like I lived in the suburbs. Um, I didn't, although I consider myself to have lived around the poverty line, I definitely didn't see a lot of struggle um, until I got older and more aware of everything. Even looking back now, I can see a lot of the microaggressions that I used to have and my family does still have. Um, I always thought that, you know, we were just people, right? I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, and until I, yeah, again, until I was 18 and I moved away and I started doing my own thing and I, I really realized the things I did as a child were problematic. The things my, my family said were problematic. I won't, I don't, I don't consider my family to be racist, but I, I mean, they, they kind of are in certain ways. I can remember my grandfather yeah. saying some really, some awful things that, you know, we brushed off as a joke and it, it's not, not funny in any way. Mm -hmm. Same with, uh, I guess, because it was all excused, like explaining things to my dad now, uh, just, just so he's aware of certain things. 
Um, he doesn't see it wrong. He doesn't fight me on it, but he's never told or was never told that it's not okay. And so yeah. me trying to educate is not always well received. And it's like, oh, it's, I don't mean it like that. I've got, I've got Afghani friends. I've got Lebanese friends. I have indigenous friends, but it doesn't matter. I have a black boyfriend, but I can still be a dick. I can still be racist. Um, exactly. But yeah, I, I guess I had a, a relatively sheltered white life growing up. Yeah. Until so now. you, you realized like, like, yeah, later in your, did your boyfriend play a major role finding out like you finding the truth like was he one of the key um happenings in your life i would say i became a little more conscious because we talked about a family and stuff like that right so i'm thinking about how how he his life was as he grew up and how my kids lives would be things like that i did have friends who who were black but i never again i was a child i didn't I didn't see their struggle. I was too busy thinking about other things like, I don't know, bullshit kid things. But I, I don't know. I'm really bad at this, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. You're really, you're really doing well. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's, I know it's not easy. I know. I also know that the step from realizing um, that every white person is actually racist because we benefit from the system into mm -hmm. distancing yourself from that um, active racism like the KKK does, but still mm -hmm. realizing and acknowledging and reflecting your own privileges is damn hard. I do know because nobody in their right mind really wants to be racist, you know, from their heart. Like if you're not no. a KKK member or whatever, like you and me now, we don't want this, especially we are having black partners, black boyfriends, you know, um, but still it's important for us to realize that even though we don't want this, it's still what we are. It's still what the system makes us to be. You know, that's exactly. why we are here today because we all we are all white, all from different perspectives, different backgrounds, with different levels of knowledge. So it's important that everybody can associate, you know, but at the same time, it's not, this is not a place to cuddle white feelings, you know, because this cuddling of white feelings should have been over like 500 years ago. I think mm -hmm. we can all agree on that. And with mm -hmm. that, with that, let's jump over to Patrick because I know wherever you are, you're feeling <laughs> this conversation already. <laughs> Ask a specific question. <laughs> like Rina and me, we know. We <laughs> like, okay, you now, you talk, tell us about yourself, your whiteness, how re you realize what, what's up. Mm. Well, I, I got politically more conscious, I think like three years ago when this whole environmental movement started. And um, I think there was like the first confrontation with uh, being in a position of privilege since, I mean, like uh, movements like Fridays for Future are predominantly white and have like a very white perspective on these kind of issues. They always are critiquing systematic uh, on a systematic level but never mention that actually this whole thing is a product a result of european colonization and everything so i wasn't really conscious about these issues just like um, a few weeks before this whole black lives matter movement started um, i read exit racism by topoka ogeta first and it was like a book which got me started into, the, the, into this kind of thinking and reflecting on uh, white privilege and all, but I continued to uh, work on it and reflect more. And um, I don't know, I listened to speeches by Angela Davis, read articles and uh, letters of, from, I don't know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X and everything. And it got me into this state of mind, like always learning and um, really getting aware of what situ where I am actually positioned in our society. And always like I had talks with you also, and it's not about like being conscious about um, racism in a way, like you said, like racism is KKK and everything. It is like about, it's a constant state of mind. 
where um, you think, for example, in a certain way of the global south, of, of workers in the global south. And um, it is not like really consciously hating on other people. It is more of exactly. the, like the, the current power dynamics in the world are racist in itself. And um, to think that this is something given, that, this, that you're not reflecting on these power structures are colonial power structures, and you're not questioning it. You're like, yeah, Europe is the more, most powerful continent in the world with the US. It's something given um, that is racist in itself, that, that is Eurocentric and everything. And I think once you realize that our society never had the interest and the idea of actually reflecting on their colonial past, their racist past, you will see how much racism is infiltrated within our system, in our way we educate, in our way we uh, view on our history. We talk about uh, the global South, the situation. I mean, the, the term developing country is so racist and Eurocentric in itself. We could have a whole discussion only on that. I'm but, telling you. Yeah. That's why you're here today. Because for those of you that don't know him, especially people from Germany watching me, go follow him on TikTok because you will learn. Like you must learn. That's why I'm I'm so honored that you're here because you do so much work on TikTok, not only about racism, about feminism, about um, so many problems we have in our society. And that's why you are such a treasure for me to be here today. I'm <laughs> I'm really grateful though, for everybody, just at this point. So I'm yeah, that, that was really deep. I mean, like... I'm happy to... <laughs> now, um, I think I another, wanna... um, another perspective that's very interesting. I just wanted to say for oh, me... Oh, sorry, Rina, I didn't get that. What... When I was 14, I met the Backstreet Boys. And this today for me is like a revival because you and Patrick are like <laughs> AJ and Kevin for me. Like, I'm, <laughs> I have to say that. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, with that one said, why don't you continue? <laughs> Come on, get into it. <laughs> <laughs> continue with what? Like, just to introduce yourself, like, how did you realize that your whiteness is even a thing? Because here, especially in predominantly white societies, we are not raised to see our yeah. whiteness, you know? So, yeah, the thing for me was, I think that I was actually kind of small when the first time I um, could witness that something is different. I maybe was like five when I asked my mother, why is, why is the skin of this man more dark than mine? And my mother answered, um, well, look at your father. He got black hair. He got a little darker skin than you. He's white, but he's not like, he got a, just a different, a little different shade of skin color than me and my mom. Um, and she said, you know, and it's perfect that the people are different. And that was perfect. But my mom was like very leftist. OK. And then I was with a friend and with their family in a zoo. And she saw a black male and she was asking her mom, why is this man darker than I am? And her mother answered, because he's coming from another country. And I was like, huh? My mom told me, but I think that this is the answer that the most parents in Germany, white parents, give their children because he's coming from another country because that or they react like, don't ask that, don't say that, we don't say things like this. Like it would be something where you have to be ashamed, but it's cool that children ask that. But this is where it starts because if you give the wrong answer, like because he's coming from another country, it will lead you through your whole life that people who look different are coming from another country. And I mean, I have cousins and I have cousins who are black and they don't speak English, like, you know, so they are German, they speak Franconian dialect. And if somebody is talking to them in English, they won't understand it maybe. So this is where the first the time- The othering, 
Exactly. Yeah. They, like they are pushing um, people that don't look German automatically into another yeah. country, literally yeah. denying them the belonging to our society. Yeah. And she's so I mean, racist. Yeah, this was, but, and this is like exactly um, the, the, that was the first thing the, or yeah, the, where I remember now, but of course I've the, like how important the answer from my mother was. I forgot that over the years. And then, yeah, that's just, I don't know. I don't know when I started, like, um, like really wanted to build up some knowledge about me in or inside of me about the everyday racism and things. I really, to be honest, I really needed to, to read the same book that Patrick read and um, like uh, the one from... Um, what white people should know about racism, but don't want to hear, like, you know, um, I really had to Natasha, read Natasha. or I had to listen to those books because it, there are so many things that you just don't realize because you never had to go through that. And of course you have friends, exactly. you have family members, but you will never feel the same like that because when you don't, when we don't want to, um, don't want to be around that topic, I go home, sit in my living room and watch TV. You know, I never had to go do that. And so then with reading those books, I started to really excuse at family members, at friends. I really started to excuse like, wow, I'm so sorry. I really didn't recognize like that. And so, yeah, that's what I just decided that you always have to speak up when somebody um, doesn't know you have to speak up. And if they say, well, maybe you are overreacting. Okay, then you get me started like for real. Yeah, no, I'll really overreact. Yes, then you really overreact. If you want yeah. me to overreact, I will go the way in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's something white people often do. They often be like, oh, that's not me. That's not who we are. You know, like we said in the beginning, like Patrick said, it's in our society. It yeah. affects everybody yeah. once you have this skin color. So, I mean, Josh, you have a whole different perspective on the whole thing because you were born and raised in South Africa as a white person. Now, <laughs> that, that's a whole different level. How is the, the racism in South Africa still affecting the apartheid situation, because I believe that the apartheid is still very much a thing, even though the world claims it was abolished long ago, not too long ago. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, I, I can see it every day on everything. You turn on the news or the internet, and obviously most people that I follow on the internet are um, South African and um, people that I know since childhood, but I, I really started to, like wait like I've always known there was something different because like I um basically the lady that helped my mom to raise me um uh she was she was black she was our house worker but she was my second mom to me and there was always like these questions that were popping up in my head like why does she get treated differently and obviously my parents have a whole different perspective because they grew up in apartheid and that was a whole nother thing i mean people can say it's over but racism is so like very prevalent and it's really bad for like white south africans have this like superiority complex and it's really stupid because we are the minority in south africa um but they still like have this air to them and it's terrible the way they treat people and like i feel like sometimes it's like physical pain or something like you, you get mad when you see it and for a long time I did not act on it because I didn't know if it's going to be safe for me first of all um because like I've heard about like white people speaking out about racism and then they got murdered or beat and stuff like that and that's crazy and it, it's like in it really started showing its colors to me. I started waking up more in um, middle school. It like, 
I see, I, I, I would see like people using the K word, which is South Africa's equivalent to the N word. Um, and it, um, it, I saw people like calling like these little girls um, that, and I, I was like, you know what, that's not okay, but I didn't speak up. That like, I will always mm. feel pity about that because I didn't have the guts to speak up back then. I didn't, I mean, I was very introverted, which I am actually not, but I, that's a whole other conversation. But um, now that I'm starting to speak up about it, um, it, it, it took me a while because in high school, just for example, um, black kids and um, especially um, even mixed people, but with the hair situation, like if uh, when I was still in high school, I don't know if it's really a problem still now. I don't really have friends younger than me that are still in high school, but I know it was a problem um, where if a black girl would get braids um, or Cohen rolls or um, any kind of protective hairstyle, they would be called out for it and sent to the principal's office. But then the white girls, they can color their hair. They get like South African schools are really strict when it comes to physical appearance. Um, you need to be neat. It's this whole structure, like sort of military thing, um, which I guess comes from the apartheid regime because it was actually, it, it, it reminds me so much of a military unit. And that is in South African schools, like black girls would get, this the amount of shit that they would get for just having braids in their hair like um i wouldn't call her a friend but like my one acquaintance from school she had these beautiful braids and they would hang like on her bum and it it was just the most beautiful thing and then she got and she was like a what do you call it a leader in school or a prefect um but she would get shit for that and i was like but you can see these other white girls coloring their hair. They're not getting shit for it, but why? And that is part of the black culture is their hair. It's their heritage. And it was taken away from them by yeah. the apartheid. And now it's yeah. being taken away in schools. And even in, like, I can see it with jobs here and stuff like that. It's really crazy. And um, I know in the rest of the world, white people also have this mentality, but it's especially in South Africa, it's the whole like, no, you're being racist against white people. That mentality is oh. really like prevalent. Yeah. And it's so, so terrible because I started seeing it. And when I started seeing it, I couldn't unsee it. It was like blasting through my mind. And it's, it's terrible because I have family members. Like I need to choose whether I want them in my life or not, because my family is very racist, like, especially on my mother's side. Um, the shit that my biological grandfather on that side did was like, he murdered people, but like, it's like a family secret. Um, and I was like, but why? Like he, he would do the most, terrible stuff and um and then the rest of our family but it was like yeah but he grew up in that time like and I get that and there was a history of mental health that was also very screwed up like he was schizophrenic and whatever but still you have a choice to do that to a person because it was very race motivated and back then when it was still apartheid you could get away with anything white people got away with every fucking thing and they still do. And they still do today. Like, yeah, exactly. And what you said, I think, is a very important white... point that white people are actually a minority in South Africa because I think the world mm. likes to look at South Africa thinking that white people are very common there, which we are actually not. We're actually looking at the world globally. We are a minority. And that's something that we've, over the years, um, brainwashed people into thinking the world or is owned by white people. We're literally, not only were we the last ethnicity to develop, we are also a minority globally. So I don't know if any one of you would like to explain why there is no racism against white people, because I think that's one of the biggest bullshit statements ever. <laughs> Anyone? Well, the main reason is that we, like white, when I say we, I mean white people made racism possible. We made that system. We made it worldwide. 
And then there is like, um, and the reason for still being like the same, like it was that we are still um, like always on the better side is that for example, a country like Germany, look in the schools like history lessons, like the colonialism of Africa is like a side fact because when we talk about racism in Germany, it's all about Holocaust. So yeah. it's, you know, even the, the when, when even the um, education is whitewashed, what do you expect? What do you expect when you whitewash education? What is the important thing? Matthew, how is it? You, you are actually still going to high school now. Do you actually learn something about um, a trend in like topics that are actually um, that need to be explained for example I think um, in school we often when like my son is going to be 12 next month and when they learn about sexuality in school they learn about man woman period nothing else and I think mm -hmm. that's also a very big problem that should absolutely be not the case so yeah. how is it in your own school do you guys learn about racism do you learn about the LGBTQ community how what's up there um, we learn about racism, but only how it's applicable to the United States. And they don't explain the fact that white people came up with the idea of race. Like, they don't explain that, like, race is not an existent part of life. We're just genetically mutated to the environments that our ancestors migrated to. And they don't explain any of that. So people do think there is an actual racial difference between white and black people. And they also don't explain that it works through a system. The school system makes it look like after the civil rights movement, racism left. Like they make it seem like black people started thriving after the civil rights movement. They don't talk about the Central Park Five. They don't talk about any other anti-black violence except for the war on drugs after the civil rights movement. So, so we don't really is, learn about it. <laughs> oh, keep sorry. No, so in your, in your own environment, where you live, is it like, can you have access to the true information other than the internet? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually live like 30 minutes away from Washington, D.C., which is a really, um, which is a majority Black city. So there, is a, there are a lot of resources for you to learn about um, Black history and Black culture and um, you know, kind of re-educate yourself. It's very easy where I live, fortunately, but um, a lot of parts of the United States, it is not easy. And again, if you're white, like you can choose not to educate yourself. So a lot of white people where I live don't educate themselves at all and just go by what the school tells yeah. them. Yeah, Patrick, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I think what Matthew said about um, racism disappeared uh, with the civil rights movement is actually pretty, accurate to how many people object these things because many people just think yeah i mean like hundreds of years old systems of oppression just vanish with one historical moment mm -hmm. the whole ideology just disappears even <laughs> though it still lies the Calcasus, within, yeah. yeah within our uh, systems i always ask these people like for example also like with misogyny within our society I asked men, do you really think women have been oppressed for thousands of years within a patriarchal system? At what point do you believe patriarchy vanished? At what point can we speak about a uh, um, patriarchal system and um, after patriarchy has been abolished? At what point do you really think patriarchy vanished within um, the moment women were allowed to vote or the moment the first women were sitting in parliament? This is these systems of oppression especially were established within ideology and the way we talk and the way we teach and educate others and an ideology just simply doesn't vanish because we just see a woman in a woman in a position of power mm -hmm. these people really think that and then i'm always asking what historical event what societal movement change process whatsoever was the indicator for racism to have been actually abolished. And they cannot name one. Never. And this because is because like there is none. That's the point. There, there is, is none. none. 
there is none. It just happened to um, exist in other ways. Maybe not like the racism we are being taught that existed like a hundred years ago, but the same system that existed back then were never abolished until today. So we still live in these racist, uh, um, sexist systems of oppression and they have never been abolished, never to mention like they every time they talk about civil rights movement and I don't know, like after World War II, there was all of a sudden no anti-Semitism or anything, but still it lives in the prison industrial complex. It lives within um, the whole way we think and talk about uh, the exploitation of the global South as if it was a fair thing or something like that. We actually don't ever talk about that in school. We just don't think, uh, reflect on it being, it might be a bad thing that world hunger is a human, um, human made thing that is not something um, that just happened. It is a cause, um, it has systematic costs and we just never reflect on that. And we talk about all these other things without ever mentioning that a rich global South, white predominant um, is uh, causing all this misery in all the other parts of the world. That's so true, yeah. Like if, if one of you could, like, because what I hear very often is white denying the fact that there's something like white privilege. And they often put that in, in the same category as poverty and um, struggling while growing up. So I think that it was very important for us to differentiate that white privilege doesn't have anything to do with poverty. You can be white and be poor. That's not even the point. The point is that white privilege is means that your skin color and your ethnicity, your appearance is never going to be a threat to you. So in opposite of that, it's even a door opener. So I think in our society in general, we are so fast to deny white privilege, one, because we are not a educated and and raised to see it and fourthly because we simply don't want to like Matthew said we don't even want to see it we can literally go home and decide not to see it because we are systematically not affected so if one of you could tell another white person something maybe one somebody that is in denial of their whiteness something what would be your statement you would give that person don't know who wants to start <laughs> I've got a good one I think. Um, so like I said, I grew up in the suburbs, but um, there was a time after my parents divorce that, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We had our, our power cut off. We were eating spam and onions and dollar store bread for a little while, but never through all that struggle did I ever feel like I was lesser because of my skin. Mm -hmm. I, I am very fortunate enough that I've never been homeless or anything like that, but I can honestly say, even if I were to be in that situation, I know somebody would help me before they would help uh, an Asian homeless person next to me or a black homeless person next to me. Like I know no matter how far down I may be financially, I am still perceived as better than. Yeah, very deep, <clears throat> very, very true. Um, I have uh, another, um, yeah, I witnessed something like I was the first thing and I have to tell like two stories about it. What I think is like a very crazy and heavy um, explanation of it because I was in a bar and I sat there with other friends and we drank something and there was that beautiful black girl sitting on like on the bar and I recognized that she was like in some way she was in discussions with people, with white people. And um, I decided to go outside, like smoking a cigarette and walking past that. And when I arrived, I heard that she said, I just don't want you to use that word and this kind of speech against me because I don't like it. It hurts me. It was German. And um I didn't want to just to speak up because I think that could be like 
the wrong way because I know that you don't have to speak up for when you are white for black people. They can do that by themselves. But I just wanted to know if she maybe wants my support. So I was just asking her, are you okay? And she went like, yeah, they just, you know, that typical kind of discussion that she just had. And all these white people around telling her, don't overreact. It's just mm. fun. I didn't mean it like that. Like all these, everybody heard that a thousand, a thousand times. So um, that's the one side. And then there was the other side where I was on a German spring market and I wanted to buy something like a wafer where you can buy those Schaumkuss and all these, right? And right in mm. front of me was that old lady and she said to the man who wanted to sell these things, like, I want the end bump kiss. And in the same, in the same time, it was like three years ago, in the same time she said it, she went like this. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. I, I shouldn't say that. I know. And he, and like the, the guy on that stand, he went like, of course you can say it. We are not like that. We don't overreact. And I was standing there like, no, you are not going to say that. And to be honest, I am a really big girl and I wanted to buy really much at you. But right now I'm leaving because you are racist. You are not saying that. And when I, when I went away, white people who heard me like freaking out when like went past me like this, that was good. You, you did the right thing. I am allowed as a white person to tell another white person not to be a racist, but somebody who is like offended, like who is the one who is insulted is not allowed to talk about it. Well, this is white privilege in Germany. That's true. And yeah. Matthew, what do you think? Um, how, like, in I know in Germany we have so many. Um, proverbs, so many words that are actually racist, but we are not even aware of that. Is it like that in America too? Like in your everyday language, in your everyday um, life, do you, are there, is there so much racism around you that you started seeing that maybe you weren't seeing before? Um, I wouldn't say it's verbal exactly. Like there's racist like words or sayings that people don't usually use publicly, but it's like sentences that someone will say um, that are microaggressions towards black people. So like, I guess like it would, they like somehow a lot of like white Americans will like fit it into what they're saying. If you've ever heard like, for example, if you complimented like a black woman, but you said, oh, you're pretty, but just for a black woman, that would be a microaggression. Mm -hmm. So that's what's really common in the United States is microaggressions and like extremely common. Like I've had family members who like would never, ever call themselves racist or anything like that. Use multiple microaggressions before. Um, and they're hard. To well, how see, are you honestly. able to see them? Um, it's some I, I honestly don't know. Um, my mom told me about some of it. She really opened my eyes um, when I was really young. She told me a lot. Um, but also like some, again, growing up around black and Hispanic kids, most of my life and not really being around white kids when I did start to go to middle school, because my elementary school was almost completely like not white. Like it was me and like two other people that were white in that elementary school. But when I went to middle school, that's when a lot of people from the white neighborhoods came into the school as well. Um, that's when I really started to notice the difference, I guess, because before, again, I wasn't around white people enough to really see it. But then when I started, when I started being around other white kids more, that's when I really started to see it. And that's when I knew it was wrong and how they would be racist in a subtle way. So being around so many did you cause you to pull that reverse racism card? But we all know reverse racism is not a thing. That there is nothing like being racist towards a white person. So on the other hand, how do you, like when you grew up so around many black people and knowing that you are in the social um, position of their oppressor, how does that affect your relationship to, towards black people? Like, does it affect your relationship towards black people in a way of, um, because of course you are trying to put your knowledge across other white people. Or, you know, I've seen your TikToks. I know yeah. that you do a lot of explanations, you know. So how does that affect your relationship towards your black friends? Um, 
It doesn't as much. And I think being um, part of the LGBTQ plus community might help that because even though racially or ethnically, I'll never understand what they struggle with. We're both, um, both black and LGBTQ plus people, especially when LGBTQ plus people are apparent that they are a part of the community. Um, both kind of like know what it's like to be hated for your existence. So I don't think they would see me as much as a, like, you know, uncomfortable, put in an uncomfortable position as they would like a straight person or an older person. But I think again, since we like kind of grew up together, like our whole lives from when we were re really young kids, they saw me more as just another friend, in my opinion, than someone that like, you know, would not understand them. And I think like always trying to understand them and not, not speaking over them a lot, like I would always genuinely try to listen to them when they talked about certain things help too, because that's what they want you to do. They want you to just listen, not give your input all the time. So I think like, just so like, true. yeah, just like being like kind of like a calm person naturally, like my like nature as a person helped me um, a lot. How is that for you, um, Josh? Like, like you already explained about the racism in South Africa. Like when you went to school, were you like separated from black people? Like, did they do that? kind of black and white thing even though you apparently grew up after apartheid i mean they didn't um really separate separate us like that but you would see like because her racism is very inherent i mean it's inherent in every white person but in south africa it's still a very fresh open wound that still needs a lot of work um But you would see like um, like the schools that I went to um, were majority white people. But you would see like the the divide that kids make within themselves. Um, that was always very apparent to me. Um, also in like high school, I started like having like more black friends because we uh, in high school, I was in a double medium school, meaning Afrikaans and English, which I I was on the Afrikaans side because it's my mother tongue. But um, yeah, it's uh, in high school, it started to become more um, less apparent, but also more in some way, like you get uh, these microaggressions you really see there. And also sometimes you would hear these teachers because I never had a black teacher in my life until last year when I started university. Um, so it was really refreshing for me. Um, uh, and it's so messed up that like, I, but I mean, like what black person would want to give a class at a racist school, you know, you wouldn't. Right. And yeah. that's why then, um, but like in, um, well, I lost my train of thought for a bit. I'm sorry, but like in, in school, it's really, it's it's really apparent and you would see like because most um like 90 of the black kids in my high school were english obviously um because they can speak afrikaans but um there's this whole um western mentality that if you do not speak my mother tongue or english you are stupid when most of these black kids or black people in South Africa, they do not speak just one language or two, they speak five. They speak Isizulu, Ikosa. I'm sorry, I mispronounced that, but um, there is um, the Khoi language, which is actually a dying language in South Africa. Um, and there are people trying to implement it in schools because it is a dying language. It's, it's, it's like Latin, nobody speaks it anymore, except the Khoi people. Um, and there, And there's like, A few years ago, and I mean, it's still a movement in South Africa, but like a few years ago, it was really strong that um, a movement formed that um, obviously black people wanted to have school in their mother tongue. They wanted to choose because that was taken away from that. That was stripped from them and their fathers and their mothers and their ancestors because of apartheid. And now, like um, when somebody says that, more than likely you will see a white person be like, I don't understand why can't they just speak English or Afrikaans? Because like, sweetie, you can choose in which language you speak. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Obviously, in university, um, you are going to get more English-based, um, especially it's a struggle in South Africa because you're so used to your mother tongue. And 
um, then you need to make that movement to English, which I, which I get like English is a hard subject in South Africa. Well, it was for me because it isn't my first language. Um, and it's like, why can't we just give them the school in their language? It isn't that hard. It isn't that difficult. They have people in their mother tongue that translate the books anyway. It's not that hard. It's really not. And the whitewashing of history in South Africa, like people still think Jan van Riebeek, like he's um, the guy that basically found South Africa. Um, but <laughs> there's these stories like that I remember in um, middle school that were in the study guides and handbooks, like of, him, of, of them telling, that's before the education reform, but the new education reform is still very racist and has a lot of stuff that needs to be oh like re-looked at and seen from both points of views not just one um and like we would thought like he was a peaceful he just wanted um like you know very christopher columbus vibes from america i don't know what you guys learned but it's like it was peaceful we just yeah. wanted land we traded <laughs> when in fact there was fucking massacres, people died, and it's like, it, if you think it was peaceful, are you stupid? You cannot you be. Think, yes, you, yes, yes, you're stupid. If, uh, if you go to ask. someone, yes, if you stupid. go to someone, it, like if you go to someone's house, um, and you take their stuff, like that video you explained, um, the other day, um, it's not, not then nobody's gonna let you just take this stuff when you go there you there's a price to it and if you're not going to meet that price then sorry and that was the negotiations that were taking place but they don't teach us about the massacres and then there's this huge gap in our history that we don't get taught um or if you're white you only get taught about the white side they, like there's a lot of books that i still need to read i still need to do research because you get, don't get taught that. It never stops. Um, the learning never stops. Yes. And, um, like, it's, uh, like, where the gap in history also comes is, um, basically, we were taught about the founding of South Africa. Then there's, like, a bit of a gap. Then there's, like, working together, but not really. And then there is the part of the Anhluabur Urloch, which is the... Uh, farmers um what do you call it a uh, war but it's basically um uh black people and white farmers that are from dutch mostly dutch descent fought together um fighting against england that wanted to colonize over the dutch colonization <laughs> if that makes sense um they wanted to get their two cents in as well um but and then white people with, with will throw that as uh, um, how do you put it a justification like but we work together there and then that's they a big thing yeah justification. the justification explanation the trivializing of racism so just like to come to an end like each of you now I know you're all doing work in your own ways um, you being here is also doing educational work because I know white people do watch this too. Like, what's your message towards fellow white people? What do we need to do as a society, collectively, globally, um, from your point of view? I mean, I can say from my perspective, especially being very young and not educated about stuff is, you need to do research, constant research, constant, 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 because we, we don't get taught that um, we need to do research. You don't get taught to see the things until you see it. It's like you need to look for them to start and to it's not easy, but you need to stand up for you, um, the people around you, no matter what race they are, um, and to stand up against their oppression, use your um, your what do you call it, um, white privilege to help them. Like if you have privilege, you can help people. And that's, I, I think a big thing in South Africa is what we need to start doing. We need to start, um, yeah, using our privilege for good and not just using it for bad. Yeah, but even at the end of the day, the, the, the goal would be that 
thing with whiteism because even our grandchildren are not going to uh, to face that they are not going to witness that change but I think it's important for us as white people to collectively own up to our privileges I mean we are all well aware of the fact that none of us that is sitting here no living white person ever owned a slave we all know that but we still it's important that we recognize the fact that we still benefit from things that happened 600 years ago because they build a system, we enable that system and we benefit from that system. So I don't know, Matthew, like, like you now that you're so young, but you're still so aware, you're so, you're so educated on that topic. Like what's your, what message do you have maybe for other young white people in your age gap that are maybe not willing or not ready or not educated yet to see what's really going on? Um, it's hard to do this without education because a lot of the things that um, black people or pro-black people will post to white people who are uneducated will seem anti-white. But my advice is just to listen. They're not against you. They don't like uh, black people don't like hate you for existing. They just want you to recognize that you're benefiting from a system that's keeping them under. So my advice is just to listen and find out what you can do, ask them questions or Google too, like, cause you don't want to ask them all your questions, but like Google's free. Um, there's books and listen, you know, and ask what you need to ask because at the end of the day, like the more you argue, the worse it makes it for everybody. So I would just say, listen. Yeah. I think it's also important. Would anybody want to add? Oh yeah. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Um, I think a lot of us as white people have to realize that many, if not all of us are innately racist and it's not okay to be racist, but it's okay to admit what you do wrong. It's okay Mm -hmm. to admit that you are wrong and that's how you grow. That's how you improve. And I know when a lot of people hear white privilege, like, well, that's not me because X, Y, Z, or, um, they will just right away say, well, no, I'm not racist because X, Y, Z. Like, no, some things that you do without realizing is racist and it's okay to admit that and then correct it. Exactly. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. We want to, we want to. Patrick, would you like to add anything to that? (laughs) I'm telling you. (laughs) I'm I would say to all the white people listening, always um, recognize privilege is not all about uh, financial privilege. It is also about not being targeted by racist fascists. Like this in itself already is a privilege and with all the right extremists, um, people in, uh, in Europe, but also in the US, becoming uh, stronger, organizing themselves better. This is more a threat to non-white people than it will ever be to you because you can decide ignoring that, but to BPOC people, it will uh, continue to become more of a threat um, every single day. And also maybe give it also a a thought that um, we will never abolish the systemic oppression which is built on race without deconstructing um, oppression um, which is created by class. Capitalism is so much profiting from uh, racial systems of oppression created by white people reconsider that capitalism has no interest in uh, deconstructing things that is benefiting uh, uh, um, from and uh, consider that if you are a white person you have more in common with a non-white worker than you will ever have with a actual rich white billionaire that is enabling this system um, and it's depending on the idea that you think you have less in common with any non-white workers. And 
I'm just like saying like when I had a call with Nicole, I think the phrase power to the people will work wonders once once people will realize that um, we have we have more in common um, with each other and we have to deconstruct these systems um, together in order for everyone to lead a um, human worthy life in this world. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a beautiful ending. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, also, I think it's important to once more emphasize that um, this is not about anti-white. This is not about a blame game. This is not about shaming other white people. This is because we are all white. Everybody sitting here is white. Everybody white on this earth benefits from the same system. Whether you want to realize it or not, it doesn't matter. And if you don't follow the journey, if you don't follow along, at the end of the day, eventually, people like us sitting here are going to become the minority. And you, that um, is denying your privileges, who are going to be eventually not going to get anywhere if white people keep holding the system back. And it's important for us to know as white people that we are the ones that need to do the work. We need to dismantle the system that people like us have um, formed, have invented and keep enabling on a daily basis. So I think that was a very deep topic. I'm very, very grateful for everybody that took their time to be here today. I'm so grateful for you guys. Oh my God, I feel so honored. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you all took your time. And to everybody that watched the video, I'm thank, thank you for watching too. And have a good night, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.